Rejoice, O Jerusalem, and come together, all you who love her. Rejoice with joy, you who have been in sorrow. Words taken from our intro today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. We shall consider today how helpful is a sanguine, light-hearted approach to Lent, and especially to the trials of this life. First, let us look at Lent. Today is a great day in Lent, Laetare Sunday, a day of rejoicing. Lent is now just over half over. But why the sudden break from morbidity? We are called out of sorrow by our introit, urged to rejoice by the light-hearted rose-colored vestments. Even if there is no Gloria in the Mass and no A word, today comes as a time out, or really more like halftime. That time during a game, when you take a break from the game, to go get a drink of water or some other refreshments, sit back, enjoy a little healthy entertainment, and conversing with your friends. I think this is more true than it seems at first sight. For Lent is really just a game, a great holy game, but a game nonetheless. And the sanguine person knows this deep down, and so do we when we cultivate that same sanguine spirit in ourselves. Now, how is Lent a game? Well, first of all, we direct ourselves and our penances to our Lord's sorrowful passion as if it were going on even now, as well we should. But all the while, we know that he lives triumphant, that it is the lamb once slain, no dead lamb anymore that descends to our altars at Mass. The many paintings of the Mass of St. Gregory depict this quite clearly. While the instruments of Christ's passion are displayed, displayed to, to illustrate his triumph, it is the risen Christ who emerges from the tomb, alive and radiant, stepping upon the altar at the consecration. Perhaps, though, we can see this most easily by looking at how one plays a game and what two excesses one must avoid to play a game well, which are the same excesses we must avoid during Lent. Now one excess that you must avoid when you play a game is simply not taking it seriously enough. This is not usually a problem in the games that we play, except perhaps in forced fun as most of the participants want to play the games they play. But it can happen that, seeing the artificial nature, they may not play very hard, not pay attention, or not follow the rules, and so on. They watch the ball go right by them and shrug, stand around and chat while they should be running and helping their team. This, not taking the game seriously enough, is what Catholics do when they do the bare minimum for Lent, like a child who is forced to play a game and resolves to do so only in the most technical sense of standing in the field. These Catholics go through their life as if the church's seasons were mere window dressing and see things like abstaining from meat on Fridays as a nuisance. They have no great sorrow during Lent, no great joy during Easter. Our Lord himself rebukes this attitude when he says, But whereunto shall I esteem this generation to be like? It is like children sitting in the marketplace, who, crying to their companions, say, We have piped to you, and you have not danced. We have lamented, and you have not mourned. The other excess one must avoid in games is much more common, at least today, taking the game far too seriously. This excess is seen on the local level with those children and the childish who are too focused on the minutiae of the game and the rules to have any fun with it. 
to spend all who spend all their time in heated arguments about who is out instead of just shrugging it off because it's just a game. It is seen on a larger and much more dangerous scale in the childish adults who regard professional sports far too seriously. The players have actual anger at the opposing team, and their fans are led to hate the other team and their fans as well, as if there were something gravely immoral about them. When their own team wins, they are elated, as if they had actually accomplished some great deed, much more elated than they would ever be after receiving Holy Communion. And when their team loses, they weep and bewail it, are downcast and mourning, sour and depressed, much more than they ever are over their own sins. As a side note, while I don't watch it, and don't recommend that you watch it either, for modesty reasons, pro wrestling, at least, is a much more honest game than a lot of other pro sports, because the athletes know they're also actors know that they are actually just playing a game. This extreme is harmful because it mistakes the game, which should be a healthy means of pleasure and entertainment, as an end in itself. A game well played will give pleasure and excitement to all who play it, even those who lose. It is only when it becomes an end in itself as if it were really real that people get far too invested in who wins and who loses. Similarly, one can view Lent and penances as ends in themselves. Now I hope that I have not given this impression by urging you to go big for Lent and to avoid that first extreme of not doing enough. But this extreme also is to be avoided. Penance is not done for its own sake. We are not lifting weights for Jesus. We are not like the carnally minded Jews who focused with great severity on keeping the exact letter of the law and then also keeping a lot of other trivial laws they made up for themselves as if doing so were an end in itself and the spirit of the law had no purpose. Much less are we in competition with each other? When we make Lent or penance an end in itself, we forget its ultimate end, union with Christ. And when we make our penances an opportunity for pride and a means to despise our neighbor, then we defeat the entire purpose and move further and further from Christ, who is close to the humble but far from the proud. To play a game well, one ought to cultivate a sanguine spirit. The sanguine person really does enjoy the things that he does while he's doing them. But once he's not, they fly quickly out of his mind. The sanguine man loves to play games. He loves to pretend to be heavily invested in them, to play his part well to be a good actor, just as much as he loves to put them down when he's done with them, to go to the bar and laugh and joke with those same people he was just competing against. We ought to play games just so, to take this game seriously as a game, to play our role in the game as best we can, all the while knowing that it's just a game, and ready to put it down and move on to real life when such life calls. Now, as I said, the liturgy itself directs us to see Lent this way, with today as halftime, as the time out, for only games have time out. You can't take a time out from reality, only from games. Laetare Sunday reminds us not to get too lost in the seriousness of our game. We also see that the sanguine man, if he can get over his love of pleasure, undertakes his penances in the best spirit. 
he knows they will end. He knows in his heart that this penance is just for a little bit, just for today, and that soon we'll move on to something else. And yet he loves playing the part, loves to jump full into those penances, to pr pretend to be a monk for a day. I suggest to you that good monks do their lifetimes of penance in a similarly playful spirit. This sanguine spirit will help us in our penances. It will keep us from that sadness and despair that the melancholic may feel when he looks at the oppressive weight of 18 more days, three weeks of cold showers. It will keep us from the excessive focus, the excessive seriousness and pride of the choleric, who easily sees the penances as an end in themselves, as a mountain to climb. To separate himself from the crowd and sets at them with proud determination. The sanguine man, on the contrary, does his penances playfully and with joy, as if he were playing a game. I believe this is important to consider because it is this same playful spirit that will help us move lightly through the worldly troubles of this life. Now, first, we must emphasize those words, worldly, worldly troubles. And they help us move through this life. The sanguine must learn to take very seriously things that ought to be taken very seriously, things that are real to the highest degree, that last forever, God, heaven, and hell, and anything and everything that directs us to one place or the other, moral choices and prayer. In these things we should not have a sanguine spirit, but quite the contrary, take them as more serious than anything, for they are the things that are truly real, the only things that last forever. So, I think you may already see how good a guide the sanguine will be in the troubles of this life. How blessed would we be if we could see the troubles of this life as they really are, as temporary, fleeting, passing, fading. Again, we speak not of moral evil, that is, of our own sin, which alone threatens to last forever in our lives but of other troubles, illnesses, injuries, enemies, hardships, all those external mishaps, all our worldly troubles. The sanguine man sees all these two as light and trivial. He doesn't have time for grudges. He laughs at injuries. He's always looking forward to a bright tomorrow if he is sick today. His own injuries are a source of amusement for him. If he limps, oh, look how funny I walk now. If he injures his right hand, uh-huh, time to be left-handed. Look at all those things I've never done with my left hand before. Look how clumsy I am. He forgets insults quickly to dwell on happier things. When one cultivates this disposition well, he is more and more immune from injury. None of the hardships thrown at him ever seem to stick for long. And rather than see this as a weakness, we should really see it as a strength. Consider this passage from St. John Chrysostom on how we ought to respond even to the most grievous of offenses perpetrated upon us by others. Let us not then vex ourselves with others, St. John says, injuring ourselves and rendering our soul weak. For the vexation is not so much at our neighbor's wickedness as from our weakness. Because of this, should anyone insult us, we weep and frown. Should anyone rob us, we suffer the same like those little children which the more clever of their companions provoke for nothing, grieving them for small causes. 
But nevertheless, these two, if they should see them vexed, continue to, te to tease them. But if laughing, they, on the contrary, leave off. But we are more foolish even than these, lamenting for these things about which we ought to laugh. Thus far, St. John Chrysostom. See the strength of the sanguine. He has little invested in this life. He sees everything worldly as a game, and laughs as much at those who take things too seriously as he does at their attempts to hurt him through insults or injuries. Just as we might laugh at a small child so consumed with rage who strikes us entirely ineffectually, as if he might be able to kill us, but who can, in reality, do us no harm. Listen to St. Francis de Sales on the care one ought to have for his reputation. As a rule, St. Francis says, indifference to insult and slander is a much more effectual remedy than resentment, wrath, and vengeance. Slander melts away beneath contempt, but indignation seems a sort of acknowledgment of its truth. An excessive fear of losing reputation indicates mistrust as to its foundations, which are to be found in a good and true life. Those towns where the bridges are built of wood are very uneasy whenever a sign of flood appears, but they who possess stone bridges are not anxious unless some very unusual storm appears. We may take a jealous care of our reputation, but not idolize it. And while we desire not to displease good men, neither should we seek to please those that are evil. A man's natural adornment is his beard, and a woman's her hair. If either be torn out, they will, may never grow again. But if only shaven or shorn, they will grow all the thicker. And in like manner, if our reputation be shorn or even shaven by slanderous tongues, there is no need to be disturbed. It will soon spring again, if not brighter, at all events more substantial. Thus far, St. Francis de Sales. In conjunction with that, perhaps you have heard this joke. What's the difference between a good haircut and a bad haircut? About six weeks. But how true is this when it is applied to our reputation? If we are of good character, it will just grow back. The sanguine lives his life as if such worldly assaults didn't really matter. And so should we, for they do not really matter. He lives with a great confidence that none of his pains will last forever, that everything in this life is temporal, is a game to be enjoyed. There's a great illustration of this in an old Farside cartoon, which you can look up on the internet. The artist depicts two devils in the flames of hell, observing with consternation a man who pushes his wheelbarrow filled with heavy stones joyfully, smiling and whistling. One devil says to the other, You know, we're just not reaching that guy. This is not to make light of hell, of course, which is serious and does last forever, and in which no one is any longer happy and sanguine. But it illustrates that sanguine spirit we ought to have in the face of even the most hellish of tormentors in this life. Just as the ancient martyrs laughed at the pains inflicted upon them by the pagans, mocked their attempts to destroy their faith in things everlasting by taking away transient goods, which will, by their own nature, fade and corrupt anyway. We must take lightly the things of earth, worldly disappointments and rejection, and take seriously the things of heaven. We should have no care for what others say about us, only for what God says to us. 
the more our treasure is safe and secure in heaven, the more lightly we can move through all the things of this life. As we should laugh at the pains and travails and insults of this life, so too should we treat our Lent as a game, as a holy game, as a game to be well played, but always with an eye to that reality, that true and resplendent life we have from our Lord Jesus Christ, who even now lives and reigns with the Father and the Holy Ghost forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.